Hi everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Could you please let me know is my voice audible to you all? So technically, the concept of today's um, game changer webinar is to let you people familiarize with the way exam is basically uh, presented, the way exam actually comes in reality and how we actually solve it. But considering I'll be going through uh, either the full exam or at least I'll be trying to attempt 70% of the exam in today's webinar, uh, I'll be doing each and everything in order to clarify that how the marks can be scored. And obviously, once we are going through the concepts, we'll be like having a good recap of all the concepts which were previously discussed. So this is how the exam would come in front of you. The exam is going to be of three hours and 15 minutes long. It's going to be a computer-based exam. So one should know um, clearly that what are basically the requirements of the examiner as far as conducting an advanced taxation exam is concerned because um, not just you have to answer the question, but you have to present them in a, in a real professional manner because uh, by presenting your answer in an appropriate manner would let you people grab 20 marks. So that is like quite sufficient if you are going to apply professional uh, acumen as well as analysis and the presentation tools appropriately in order to answer your question. So this is basically the instruction being shown in front of you and that's something which will be presented to you people first when you will be attempting your question live as the exam which we are going to do is not uh, time bound but of course the real exam will be time bound and you'll be like provided with three hours and 15 minutes to do each and everything and your paper your exam is consisting of section a and section b so here i'm going to take a start with section a which is of worth 50 marks out of which 40 marks are the technical ones while 10 marks are related to professional presentation so professional marks are 10 while technical marks are 40 so yes we are going to begin with the exam it's section A. This is the general um, instruction given that you should assume that tax rates and allowances for the tax year 22, 23 and for the financial year 31st, my 23 will continue to apply for the foreseeable future. So all those students who are in uh, the current session or who are not enrolled, uh, as this session is like for all, uh, keep one thing in mind that Finance Act 22 is applicable. The calculations and workings need only to be made near to the nearest pound. All appo apportionments should be made to the nearest month. And in your live exam, you should indicate with the requirements each of your uh, responses relate to this, that relate to that. This is clear for markers. And show all the notes and workings that you want marker to see uh, within your response. Remember, any notes working made on the scratch pad on or your working paper will not be marked. Of course, working paper is not going to be submitted. Scratch pad is not submitted. So the thing is, it's uh, the working which has to be shown clearly. That's basically the key rule of passing your paper that number one, time should be managed appropriately. And all the things which you are going to calculate, their working has to be properly shown as well as referenced. There you go. We are going to take a start with section A. Read what is written, what is there in front of you, which is like evident on your screens. And then I'll scroll it up and I'll keep on going through each and every exhibit. And once I'll be... I'll be done showing you all the exhibits. That means that I would have shown you the whole question for which the answer will be constructed shortly. So start reading the question. Now, as of now, I have shown you all the exhibits, including the questions. Here, the biggest thing which you should know that this wants... You should assume that today's date is 1st March and respond to the instruction in the email from your manager. 
the split of the marks allocation is shown in exhibit five, which we have done. So keep this thing in mind that how the answer has to be presented when it comes to section A, either you have to make draft notes or um, you're going to make a memorandum or you are going to make an email. So this uh, is basically the response to the email, which has to be made by us and it was said in the last exhibit that we have to make the memorandum. So you can use these highlighters in order to highlight the specific points so that when so you're going to construct your response, uh, you would instantly come to know that what key features are to be included within the body of your answer. So uh, it's like we have to prepare the memorandum. So be very careful whenever you are asked to write a letter or memorandum or notes because each and every answer has to be presented in its own specific way. Now here, of course, we would try to give an answer in the manner in which it is asked, but that's not a hard and fast rule. I mean, technically they've asked us five questions from A to E. And if you're confident about uh, part requirement B or requirement E, you may just put down the number or the reference uh, letter for the relevant requirement and start solving your that particular part of the question. I mean, that's not necessary that you'll be following exactly the same approach in which the questions have been asked. It is totally dependent on your flex flexibility, your total choice that which option you would like to solve first. So the first thing is about CORE's UK residence status for the tax year 23-24. And though this is the requirement that we have to discuss his residence status, one should not forget that they have technically asked two questions related to it. I mean, here we need to make explanations related to two matters, or you can say that there are two sub requirements and this part of the question is of six marks. Okay, now the thing is that how the answer has to be solved. As you could see one thing that the first part is starting with the word explain. In my previous sessions as well, I had been concentrating over this fact that one has to pay stress on the verb being asked in the question. So here we have to explain that how Corey's UK residence status for the tax year 23-24 will be determined and conclude on his likely residence status for that year. I've already confirmed that none of the automatic overseas or automatic UK tests have been met for 23-24 and you therefore do not need to consider these further. I mean, we'll be applying uh, the rule related to the number of days the taxpayer spent in UK along with the um, number of ties uh, that has been met for the particular year in order to see whether he will be treated as a UK resident person or not. But the fact is that uh, the verb on which we have to focus is explained. Now I am going to ask you a very simple question. Could you see on the left hand side, you are given with the response option. Which response option would you choose? Would you like to give your response on Word document or you're going to give your response on spreadsheet? Yeah, exactly. As you have to um, like write the answer, it's better to choose Word processor. And for instance, if there, there is any question for which only the calculation is required, then I'll be choosing the spreadsheet. And all those questions where explanation as well as calculations both are to be done, then their um, arguments or the statements are to be made on spreadsheet and simultaneously we'll be using, uh, sorry, their arguments are to be made on word processor and simultaneously we'll be using spreadsheet in order to show the workings or the calculative part of that question. So either you'll be using word response or you'll be using a spreadsheet. Be very sure of the fact that which uh, response option would suit your requirement. 
and there may be like many questions where not just the discussion has to be made but calculation has to be shown as well and for those questions you will be using both of the options so first of all i'm going to show you that how i'm going to start giving an answer because as the memorandum has to be made so i would write down the number of the question it's question number 1 part a which is i'm which is being done right now so that examiner may easily check your answer and give you enough credit so here i am going to make for whom we are making this memorandum for the internal record purposes for the files for the specific matter and then we need to write down the name of the person our client name is then the subject for which this memorandum is being drafted it is core is personal and company tax matters corporate and personal matters So for what purpose it is being made, what's the subject, who is the client and who is going to prepare this memorandum. These all are to be mentioned and this is like going to be prepared by the tax senior. As in the question, it was mentioned that manager has given an email to the tax senior. So tax senior is doing all this these things in most of the questions it is the tax consultant or the tax junior to whom the email is given so it is the tax senior who is basically going to prepare these memorandum and now i'm going to start with part a where we need to determine score is uk resident status for the tax year 2324 let's have a look at um, the exhibit one, which was about Corey's personal detail. What has been said in this question that Corey has always lived in the UK until on 6th April 2020, he sold his home in the UK and moved to the country of Medora with his wife, Dana, and their daughter, aged 10. They always planned to return to UK at some point such that they would continue to be domiciled in the UK. Kore began working for the company in Medora on 1st May 2020. But in March 2023, uh, his sister Florence became seriously ill, which is why they had to move back to UK on 6th of April 2023. So that's basically an important line. But the period which was not spent in UK period from 6th April 2020 to 5th April 2023. As Kore has not been resident in the UK for tax purposes during the period, however, he visited the UK, uh, staying in hotels in the following manner. In the tax year 2021, he came there for 49 days. Then 21-22, he came to UK for 105 days. And then in 22-23, he visited UK for 74 days. And when it comes to 6th April 2023, since that date, um, on 1st June 2023, Kore and Dana purchased a new family home in the UK. And on the same date, Dana started a new full-time job in the UK and became UK resident. Kore and Dana have retained their home in Medora because Kore was continued uh, working over there and doesn't... Um, and did not work in the UK. And it is envisaged that Kore will be have been in the UK for 115 days in the tax year 23-24. So keeping all this information in mind, now I'm going to determine their status for the tax year 23-24. As we know that any taxpayer's uh, residency status is confirmed by applying the statutory test, as what I've said uh, before, that we need to see that how many days they've uh, spent in UK along with um, uh, the number of ties they've got with UK and it's also dependent on the fact that whether the relevant person was UK resident before the current tax year or not so all, keeping all these things in mind this is called the statutory residency test which requires 
an application of prescribed test to figure out that whether this relevant person is UK resident or not. So, first of all, I am going to generally consider tourist residency tests will be determined through statutory redundancy test. So, this is what we need to write in general. Mm -hmm. And as it is already mentioned in the question that Core's status cannot be determined automatically, because in the question it was mentioned that he was neither an automatically non-resident person nor automatically resident person. And that's why it will be determined by the number of ties he has got with UK. Could you see that he has not been resident in any of the previous three tax years? See? In the tax year 2021, 20, 21, 22, and 22, 23, he had not been resident in the UK. Yeah, it's residency test. You can also call it as statutory residency test. As in the law has actually uh, laid down such rules. So it could also be called as statutory redundancy test. So as it is said that he has not been resident in the previous three tax years, before this tax year 23-24, where Kore, along with the family, had to come back to UK in order to attend his ill sister. And he will be in the UK between 91 to 120 days in the tax year 21-22. Could you see that he has spent an ample number of days in the tax year 21-22 and... From 6th April 2023, they're also going to spend ample number of days in the UK. I mean, 115 days. And these number of days will be uh, found in between 91 to 120 days. Uh, let me just show you that you are given with the tax tables as well. In the tax tables, you can find this table, which is called the residency test or the statutory redundancy test on the basis of which one can easily figure out that whether a person is to be treated as resident of UK or not. Uh, there's a question that is it about all about determining the ties in then yes, we will have to discuss his residency status for that purpose. Uh, the sufficient ties test needs to be discussed. And then as he has spent 115 days in the tax year 23-24, which is found in between 91 to 120 days. Could you see the arrow? I'm just moving the arrow. Can you see it? Because this is not being highlighted. Right, so? Okay. So, as he has spent 115 days, which, which makes 91 to 120 days, he'll be treated as a resident person if two UK ties or more UK ties are fulfilled if he is a previously resident person, which is not the case over here. And uh, he will be treated as resident person if three UK ties are met if he is a not previously resident person. By considering that what is the previous resident status, we need to check three previous tax years. So he basically is falling in this capacity where he has not been a previously resident person but now he's going to spend ample number of days in the tax year 23 24 and need to figure out that whether this person is to be treated as a UK resident person or not now uh, not just the number of days which are given in the question we need to consider the ties as well uh, I'm just going to give you a hint of all the ties and you will have to tell me whether the ties are being fulfilled or not if ties are fulfilled, just write yes in the dialogue box. If the tie is not fulfilled, then write down no in the dialogue box. So number one, does he have a spouse or a minor child in the UK with him? Yes or no? Okay. Yes, he has got spouse or a civil partner and even a minor child whose age is 10 in the UK. So one tie is found positive. Okay. Second tie is that does he have any place to live in the UK? 
yes he has got a new home in uk so they have got a place available either a purchased house or a rented house or some relative's house which is for sure available in the uk for which you can make use of and so you're going to visit uk that's basically the point uh over here but considering as it's their own house that which they have purchased so yes uh they've got uh an accommodation where they can live in third are they doing is he doing substantive work by substantive work by substantial work i mean to say if a person is said to be working for a period of more than 40 days if a person would be working for a continuous period of 40 or more than 40 days he will be uh, believed to be involved in providing substantive work is that so yes or no dana started a new full time job so it's not just about 40 days she'll be like working as a full time worker in the uk and the fact is either you or the spouse to whom you are going to join if that person is like in a full time job then the tie is fulfilled right but uh, this is the criteria when the person is going to join the spouse they 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 had moved to uk together right is that so so technically if a person if if his spouse had already been uk and he was joining uh, uh the spouse later then this tie would would have been considered as fulfilled but here we are going to apply the criteria on uh, kore to which yes you have perfectly answered that the tie has not been satisfied because he himself is not working uh on a substantive basis in uk though his spouse is and they have uh, together moved to move back to uk so uh, the, the criteria related to later joining the spouse is not being fulfilled is not being actually applicable in this case we just need to see that we are determining the residency status for kore and he is not doing a substantive work so this tie is not being met has he been resident in the uk for more than 90 days in either of the previous two tax years we are talking about the tax year 23 24 as far as um, the exhibit 1 is concerned so the previous two tax years i mean 22 23 and 21 22 has he been uh, able to visit the uk for more than 90 days in either of the previous two tax years it's pretty much clear the dialog box is, uh, the exhibit is being displayed in front of you. Could you see that the two tax years prior to the tax years 23-24 uh, for which the residence status is to be determined? In these two tax years, um, he has visited for 105 and 74 days. So in either of these two previous tax years, there has been for sure a tax year in which He spent more than 90 days in the UK, right? Yes, he has visited UK, but he was not resident. So he has resided in the UK. I mean, resided, uh, stayed, spent time in the UK for a period of more than 90 days in either of the previous two tax years. And, the, and we would say that this condition has been satisfied as well. There is one more uh, condition to be considered over here, but I think three tests are enough could you see that i have just shown you the table where i told you that he is the person who be treat who has to be treated as a non previously resident person and if three or more than you three uk ties are met he'll be treated as a uk resident person for this tax year and considering three ties are fulfilled then th this would mean that he is going to be treated as a uk resident person though there is one more tie as well uh that has he spent more time in UK as compared to the rest of the world, which I believe, yes, for the tax year 23, 24, they all are living in the UK. They must be spending more time in UK as compared to the rest of the world. But uh, considering as long as three ties were met, then that's sufficient. This person is going to be treated as a UK resident person for the tax year 23, 24. So Kore will satisfy three of the UK ties, which, is, uh, which make him a UK resident person in the tax year 23, 24. 
and being a UK resident person, he will be subject to pay what UK income tax uh, on his overall income, even his uh, including his in overseas income as well. So uh, though he's like going to have uh, a double taxation relief in UK as well. And this relief is basically determined by making a comparison of what the tax has been paid in the country of Medora and being imposed in UK. Is that clear? Okay. So he spent 115 days in UK in the tax year 23-24, while in Medora he spent 250 days. So, right, you are absolutely right. He has not spent more time in UK as compared to the rest of the uh, parts of the world. But considering three ties are fulfilled, so he's going to be treated as a UK resident person. So what am I going to do over here? I am going to construct my response that... In general, what I said that his residency test is going to determine his residency status and uh, as you have mentioned, because this is the response to an email to the manager is being made. So, uh, in a professional way, the memorandum has to be uh, prepared in which we are addressing to the manager. So the word you has to be mentioned. So as you have already mentioned that Kore is neither and automatic resident person non non an automatic non resident person for uk for the tax year 23 24 we need to apply sufficient ties test along with number of days Kore has spent in UK by keeping the fact in mind that he has been previously non-UK resident person for the last three tax years. So this is how in general we have said that uh, the automatic tests are not being applied on him. So we need to apply the sufficient test in order to see that what is his status for the tax year 23-24, which is being done on the basis of sufficient uh, ties test. And then I will be like getting more specific to the matter as Kore has spent 115 days in UK. which is found in between 90 to 120 days if three ties are satisfied then he will be treated as UK resident person. And I'm going to list down the ties which are being met. Having spouse or civil partner 
or minor child in UK? The answer is, as what you told me, yes. Doing substantial work in UK? The answer is no. Then having an accommodation to live in UK in the tax year and precisely for a period of 90 days. I mean, this fact is not necessarily to be mentioned, but if you mention the fact that the accommodation is available and they can freely use it by freely using some accommodation, it would mean that they can have a, a, a use of this accommodation for a continuous period of 90 days. Then, of course, this tie is being met as well. And the fourth tie was that Having spent 90 no, no, it's not like that they'll be spending at least um, one day on it. They should have an accommodation which they can make use of would mean that uh, no matter how many times they would be visiting the UK, uh, that certain accommodation will be available to them for use. And uh, we need not to specify this thing, but if we go deep down into the tax law, there is like mentioned a criteria of 90 days as well. Yes, though indirectly it is compulsory, but what I'm saying that it need, if you do not mention it in your, in, in your exam, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, if, if you would just be mentioning that having an accommodation one can make use of, that's a sufficient statement. So what was the fourth tie? Having spent 90 days or more in either of the previous two tax years? And the answer is yes. So now we would say that as three ties are met, so Kore will be treated as UK resident person for the tax year 23-24. And now what is left to be written? Uh, this is the maximum response that I'm creating. You can uh, squeeze your lines. You can uh, even summarize the whole thing in your own words whenever you are going to attempt this thing in your live exam. Now you will have to tell that what consequences will he have to bear if he becomes a UK resident person. So being a UK resident person who will have to pay tax on his total income including overseas income though double taxation relief will be available on it, right? So this is how you are going to construct your response. And as the whole response was related to the explanation, I did not have to do any calculation at all, which is why I did not choose the spreadsheet option for making my response. Yes, you can write it like this. Yes or no. It, these are the questions. So writing yes or no or simply you can say satisfied or not satisfied. 
or uh, you can make a, a single statement by saying that uh, there are three uh, sufficient ties which are satisfied, namely uh, having spouse in the UK, doing substantial work and having an accommodation which he can make use of. So on the basis of three ties, he'll be treated as a UK resident person. So if this is your exam, you will have to uh, present your answer uh, in such a way that this will be uh, clarifying each and everything. So you can write it as yes or no. You have made the full statement as well, right? Okay, now what the second requirement related to it, but before that, let me just tell you that when we came to the manager email, what we had to determine See, I'm going to tell it to you again. We had to explain how CORE's UK resident status for the tax year 23-24 will be determined and conclude on his likely resident status for that year. I mean, for the tax year 23-24. And it was said that he is neither treated as an automatic UK test nor an automatic non-resident uh, person. And we also had to show that how becoming UK resident would affect CORE's liability to income tax. We have said that he will have to pay income tax on all of his income, including overseas income, though uh, he will definitely have a, a double taxation relief for it. So these were the sufficient lines in order to score these many marks. And they also said that we need not to go into the detail. I mean, we were not supposed to uh, discuss the availability of split year treatment. So this was not to be discussed and we did not discuss it at all. Is there any confusion related to part A of this question? Um, okay, there's a question in the exam. Are the exhibits numbers also shown? Yes, of course. So that it's it's not just an easy thing for a candidate, for a student to uh, construct a response, but it's also going to help examiner to locate the answer and mark it. So definitely the numbering will be shown clearly in your real exam. Okay. So just moving to the second requirement of this question, which is of 11 marks. So that's going to be a good sized question being asked. For code is disposal of assets in the tax year 22, 23 and 23, 24, for which both exhibit one and exhibit two are relevant. They have made it clear. And uh, he is... You, you should assume that Kore is used UK resident person for the whole of the tax year 23-24. Sorry, I'm just going to take a pause over here. There's a question. Please guide me on this. Uh, could you please elaborate that what sort of guidance you're talking about? This is like, could you see that with exhibits, numbers are given. It's like in the actual exam, the numbering will be given so i didn't understand spouse tie in deciding job for oh okay okay that was just a by the way thing which i discussed that there is a split year rule in which if the spouse is already there in the uk and uh, the second spouse is going to join him or her then considering the first person is doing a full-time job when the second person joins him that person becomes an automatically a UK resident person but that's not the case being applied over here because both husband and wife went at the same time to UK so this point is not applicable at any case I was just discussing the other rule okay so what I was telling that uh, we have to assume that Kore is UK resident for the whole of the tax year 23-24 and we know this thing that his status for the tax year 22-23 where he was non-resident person and he's like going to receive taxable income in the year of 42,320 before deduction of his personal allowance. So just imagine if his personal allowance is going to be deducted against 42,320, his income will be uh, falling down below 37,700 pound. So he is most likely to be a basic rate taxpayer for the tax year 23, 24. And here we need to discuss two things. We have to explain how each of Corey's disposal in the tax year 2223 will be treated for the purposes of capital gains tax. And we have to compute his CGT liability for the tax year 
23, 24 as well. Could you see that for this requirement, we need to make an explanation? The first thing. And we have to calculate his tax liability as well. So explanation, the discussion and calculation both are required. So it's like that I'll be using both response options for the explanation. I'll be using word processor option for calculation purposes. I'll be using spreadsheet and, and there I'll be clearly given, giving the reference of the question for which the answer is being made so that examiner will find it easy for marking purposes. Okay. So I hope now, uh, Exhibit 1 is pretty much clear to you. As for the tax year 22-23, he was a non-resident person. But for the tax year 23-24, he became a resident person, right? So I'm just moving to Exhibit 2, which was like quite informative as far as disposals are concerned. So it is said that disposal of assets which were made in the tax year 22 23 we need to see that on 1st december 2022 core sold a statue situated in the garden of his home in medora statue falls under the category of chattel right it's a movable asset so painting statue decoration items they all fall under the same category on which specific rules related to chattels are to be applied he had purchased the statue for 17000 pound on 1st september 2020 and the sale resulted in a capital loss of 7400 pounds but the fact is that if he is a non resident person uh then does he need to do his calculation for the tax year 2223 and the most important thing is that the sale has resulted into a capital loss, right? So could you please tell me in a very summarized way, what's your stance on it? Do I need to do the calculation for the disposals made in the tax year 22-23? Just tell me. Uh, okay, just tell me. Are, is this like going to be a chargeable asset? A uh, statue is not a wasting chattel. Had it been a wasting chattel, then its life must have been mentioned. Uh, okay, most of you have said yes. Someone said no. Uh, no UK tax paid when on non-resident person. Uh, perfect. And not unless the loss is carried forward. Okay, let me just tell you that on Kore, a temporary absence period rule for ab abroad is going to be applied because whosoever the person is going to uh, be temporarily absent from UK for a period of less than five years. If, if someone used to live in UK and then he went absent for a period of less than five years and then he resumes his um, residency status, that person is like said to be a temporarily absence, uh, absent person for UK purposes. So whatsoever the asset he used to own before leaving the UK, if it is sold in the period of absence, its gain is chargeable. So if the statue had been purchased before he had left for Medora, I mean, while he was in UK and while he was non-resident, he was living in the country of Medora. He sold the statue. Any gain or loss would have been considered. But the gain or loss would be considered as due on the day he arrives UK. I mean, in the tax year, when he resumes his residency status, the gain or loss shall be treated. But the fact is that there is like said to be no calculation at all. Now I'm going to tell you the correct answer no calculation at all and what's the reason behind this thing though his absence is regarded as a temporary absence period abroad but still i'm saying that no calculation on the statue should be applied yes it was purchased in the period when he was uh, not in the uk so any asset which was acquired before uh, leaving uk 
if it is sold while being absent from UK, while he was non-resident, then it could be chargeable for capital gains tax purposes, but it would become due the moment he arrives to UK, but not in this case, because these are those assets which were acquired while he was resident in the UK. So, considering the statue was both bought and sold while he was living in the country of Medora, which is why capital gain loss or even the capital gain is not going to be treated for, for under UK CGT rules. I mean, as this is the loss, so no relief is going to be available. And what about this? The second asset. On 1st February 2023, as a result of the commercial takeover, Corey received 4,000 shares in TW Public Limited Company, a holding of less than 1%, and 12,000 pound cash in exchange for 2,000 shares in SQ Public Limited Company. So considering it is not merely a paper for paper exchange, rather uh, Corey is going to receive cash in exchange of the shares. So uh, this will lead to the calculation of chargeable gain, but would he be liable for capital gains tax purposes or not? Could you see that uh, this holding was acquired on 1st of June 2015 when he was living in the UK, right? So he had owned the asset prior to uh, prior to the fact that he would have left UK, but I'm considering he's going to resume his status within a time period of five years. So whatsoever the thing has been sold in a period of his um, non-residence, from UK shall be chargeable for taxation purposes, but that gain is going to be due the day he arrives in the UK. I mean, he's like going to arrive on the day which falls in the tax year 23, 24. So the gain or the loss shall be treated uh, as if it's related to the tax year 23, 24. So I'm just going to uh, write down these points for the disposals which were made in the tax year 22-23 because in the question it is asked that we need to do the explanation related to the disposals made in 22-23 and 23-24 and then we do the calculation and the calculation is going to be due in the tax year 23-24 for which I will be choosing the spreadsheet option. There's a question could you remind what's the paper for paper exchange for instance? Uh, there is a company in which we have got a shareholding and that company is going to be taken over by another company or the company is going to change its capital structure. And as a result of this, they're going to ask us for our shares. We are going to give them back our shares. And in reply to this, in response to this, they are giving us the replacement shares. So the old shares were given back and we got the new shares. So this is said to be a paper for paper exchange. Okay, so I'm just going to make a response on word processing sheet. So it's the requirement B. As one should not forget that we are making uh, the memorandum. And if we are making the notes or the memorandum, it's always advised that we'll be making a suitable short heading as well so that examiner may understand in the first line even that what we are trying to do further. So we would write the disposals in the tax year 22-23. And I need to highlight this heading as well. Could you see there is an option of bold and to present it in italics or underline the statement. And we can also use short keys, control B in order to make the statement bold. Now I'm going to uh, write uh, the tax implication related to disposals made in the tax year 22-23. So what I would write that for the sake of CGT purposes, Pure is being treated as temporarily 
absent from UK and that's because Number one, he has been absent from UK for a period of less than five years. Number two, There's also uh, one more condition uh, which has to be fulfilled for a person to be treated as temporarily absent, uh, which is like uh, necessary for a person to be counted as the one uh, who is temporarily absent from UK as in before leaving UK or leaving for the country of Medora he has spent at least four of the last seven tax years immediately prior to the tax year of departure right so considering he has spent a time period of at least four out of seven years before leaving uk and when he was absent from UK, his absence period was very limited. It was of less than five years. And then he resumed his residency status in UK, which is why the, uh, the period of absence will be counted as a temporary absence period abroad. And then as this is like, uh, uh, this is what I'm discussing, the general criteria under which Kore is going to be treated as a person being temporarily absent uh, from UK. So, under temporary absence period abroad or temporary absent period absence period from UK, he will be chargeable for UK CGT on any asset whilst he was living overseas. Provided he owned that asset before leaving UK. So as long as he used to own the asset before uh, the date of departure, all the assets which are sold in the period of his absence will be chargeable for UK tax purposes. But they are going to be due in the tax year in which he makes his return. But whatever the gain or loss is, that will be considered due in the tax year 
in which kore arrives which is in this case tax year 2324 right and uh, now as what i have told completely that what has to be the treatment for the assets which are sold under temporary absence period abroad now be specific with the assets which are sold in the tax year 2223 as Number one, considering the statue has been sold and purchased in the period while. Kore was living in Medora. That's why it is not subject to UK capital gains tax liability, right? And when it comes to the situation of the takeover, the gain related to the takeover of sq public limited company will be subject to tax in the tax year 2324 rather than in the year in which the disposal has taken place right so that's how we have made clear that he is falling under the temporary absence period abroad rule and what has to be done with the assets sold under the temporary absence period and considering the specific uh, assets being sold by him in the tax year 2023 uh, the statue has nothing to do with it but the gain is definitely going to be chargeable but in the tax year 2324 is there anything which is confusing at least uh, the disposals related to tax year 2223 are concerned do let me know then there is a question that is this part sufficient for uh, explanation of takeover uh, see i have just said that this gain is going to be due in the tax year 2324 when he would regain his uh, status of being a uk resident person so when i'll be doing the calculation i'll have to discuss more but here i'm just telling that this is not going to be due in 2223 so calculation will be done later so when the calculation is going to be due its explanation will be, then be made uh there was one more question for which the answer has been perfectly uh, made um good uh i hope this answer was like uh, very well explained you you are now clear about it uh, but still considering that these shares were acquired at the time when kore was uk resident so if he is like going to sell them when he has left uk but in the country of medora where he when he actually sold those shares he did not prolong his stay his stay in the country of medora was very short and just after 3 years he again become a uk resident person he moved back to uk along with his family so in a very short period of time considering you used to reside in uk before and then you became a uk resident person again so in such 
temp a short time period if any asset is sold this is like classified as the period of temporary absence in which if the asset is sold had this asset been acquired in the time period when a person used to be a uk resident one then the gain or loss shall be calculated and it's going to be treated for um uk taxation purposes for uk cgt purposes but the gain or loss is not going to be due when he is in the country of medora i mean he is like non resident person the tax is going to be due when he would be gaining the status of being a uk resident person again when he would regain the status then the gain is going to be due so that he can easily pay off all the taxes to uk right mm -hmm. Now, discuss the disposal implication. Sorry, CGT liability calculation for the tax year 23-24. As, of course, when he's like going to um, regain his status in the tax year 23-24. So, whatsoever sold in the tax year 23-24 are definitely subject to uh, UK CGT along with the, uh, the takeover procedure which happened when he was in the country of Medora, that's also going to be due in the year in which he becomes a UK resident person once again. So now as I have to do the calculation, which is the second sub requirement of requirement B, I think I should choose spreadsheet because now the calculations are required, right? So let's have a look at the disposal thing as well. First of all, I would like to calculate the disposal of uh, 2000 shares in SQ Public Limited Company, which were made on 1st February 2023. Could you see one thing that on 1st February 2023, as a result of commercial takeover, Core received 4,000 shares in TW Public Limited Company and 12,000 pound in cash. So how much consideration he's like getting in the form of cash? The consideration received in the form of cash is 12,000, which is to be taken as disposal proceed. But what did he used to have for which when the takeover took place, he got 4,000 shares and 12,000 cash. He initially had 2000 shares in SQ Public Limited Company. And when it was uh, taken over by TW Public Limited Company, TW Public Limited Company gave Core 4000 shares in the new company and 12,000 pound cash. So this could be treated as a part disposal as in the previous shares when they were given back to TW Public Limited Company, the new company gave them not just the shares, I mean, it was not just a paper for paper exchange, but he got the cash as well. So this should be treated as a part disposal of old shares. I need to know that what cost could be associated with the old shares for which the consideration is being received in the form of cash. And it is also said that one share in TW Public Limited Company was worth £3.5 on that day. And Corey had purchased his 2,000 shares in SQ Public Limited, a holding of less than 1% for £13,500. So how much cost he has actually spent in the past for the sake of getting these 2,000 shares in SQ Public Limited Company? They were of £13,500. And uh, when the takeover had taken place, this cost has to be split uh, over the new shares being acquired from uh, in TW Public Limited Company as well as the cash being received so that we can easily associate that how much cost could be attributable to shares and how much cost could be attributed to cash. And whatsoever the portion is being received in the form of cash, that would be resulting into a chargeable gain. The portion of previous shares which are going to be exchanged with new shares as a result of takeover shall lead to no calculation at all because it is mainly a paper for paper transfer. So what I'm going to do, I am going to open the spreadsheet. Here I'm going to mention that I'm going to answer part B so that it becomes easy for the examiner to figure out that where did I actually uh, gave my answers. I constructed my response. 
So it's about the CGT liability in the tax year 23-24, right? I'm going to double click on the cell in order to accommodate the statement in the cell in order to enhance the size of the cell. Now, first of all, I am going to see that what is the gain related to SQ public limited company for which I'm going to do a working. Okay, I'm just going to go down. Working one, that's related to SQ public limited company. Whatsoever the amount we have received as a result of takeover shall be taken as disposal proceed. And how much cash we have received in the form of consideration? That's of 12,000 pound. And now I need to see that how much cost can I associate with these shares? In the past, in SQ, public limited company 2000 number of shares were purchased and their cost was 13500 pounds see i am not using the symbol right now though uh, as you can see this arrow i mean this hand sign if I click on the symbol, I can choose the pound sign over here. But that is like going to be a lengthy activity if I keep on using pound signs every now and then. So what would I do when I will be like formulating the final answer? When I will be giving the final answer, I shall write the pound sign. Or maybe the pound sign will be uh, mentioned exactly in the top of the quest, uh, of the answer so that whatsoever the values are falling under it will automatically be understood are in pound currency so it's not advisable to keep on using pound sign every time that is like a, a complete wastage of time now what i have to do is i need to determine that how much cost could be associated with shares and how much cost could be related with cash now when it comes to shares how many shares we are going to get four thousand and what is the market value of each share we received as a result of takeover? As a result of takeover, whatsoever the new shares uh, we are going to get, each share has got a worth of £3.5 per share. So it's like £3.5 is the market value of each new share received in the new company as a result of takeover. And from the new company, we have also received cash. And cash has got a worth of 12,000 pound. Here I need to know that what is the total market value which has been received in the form of shares. It's like 4,000 shares are being received whose market value is 3.5. That's of 14,000. So what have I actually done? I am going to see that what is the total market value of the consideration we are receiving as a result of takeover? As in the question, the consideration is like um, dual sort of consideration as the consideration is being received in the form of cash as well as shares. I just wanted to know what the market value of the shares being received as a consideration is and how much consideration has been received in the form of cash. And that's how I'm going to take the grand total, the overall consideration which we have got in the form of shares as well as cash as a result of takeover is of 25,000 pounds. That is like said to be the total consideration, which is basically a combination of consideration received in the form of shares as well as the consideration received in the form of cash. And now on the basis of this individual consideration i will be able to figure out that how much cost can i associate with cash as well as shares now 
what I am going to do, I need to determine what is the cost related to 2000 share. Uh, sorry, what is the cost related to 4000 shares? Cost relevant for 4000 shares as 4000 shares are received in the new company. Could you see 14,000 pound is the market value being received in the form of shares as a result of takeover out of the total consideration, which is of 26,000 pound. Could you see that what the total consideration is out of which 14,000 is the consideration received in the form of shares? You can easily figure out the percentage of the cons consideration uh, received in the form of shares. And that percentage shall be multiplied with the previous cost as the previous cost for the shares was 13,500. And that's how you'll be able to come to know that out of 13,500, how much cost you can attribute to new shares, right? Let me just show you that 13,500 was the previous cost, which is going to be divided over new shares and cash on the basis of their current market value. So how much is the cost related to these new shares? That's 14,000 pound divided over total consideration into the cost, which is 13,500. So 7269.231 could be the cost associated with new shares. Uh, could you see that it is appearing in three decimal points, which is like not a very professional thing. So either you would type it down as 7269, or if you want to take uh, the calculation in decimals, then two decimal figures are sufficient. So hand sign is like visible in front of you. This is like going to be done like this or this could be customized according to your choice but I would believe that one should not go into this kind of uh, activity so it's far better if you take uh, the value in uh, decimals then two decimal points are enough they actually give you a professional look otherwise you can also type it down as 7269 now I'm going to see that how much cost could be associated with cash. I mean, how much cost is relevant to the previous shares for the sake of which when the takeover had taken place, we received cash. So cost for receiving cash, cost related to cash. It's like going to be determined again on the basis of market value as 12,000 pound is the market value just associated with cash. I mean, the amount received in the form of cash out of the total consideration, which is of 26,000 pound. This total consideration was received as a result of takeover activity. And this has to be multiplied with the previous cost. And that's how we'll be able to come to know that how much cost we can associate with the consideration received in the form of cash is equal to 12,000 divided over 26,000 into 13,500. And that's how we come to know that 6230.769. Again, I'm going to take it to two decimal figures. 6230.77 or better to take it as 6231. This is the uh, cost which could be associated with cash. When shares will be sold against disposal proceed, 7269.23 will be deducted. When uh, the amount is received in the form of cash, against this, the cost that we can attribute, we can allocate is of 6231 pounds so that we can come to know what the gain figure is. So this is appearing in the cell E49. Now, I'm going to compute the gain as a result of takeover. The previously held shares in SQ Public Limited Company were taken over by TW Public Limited Company and they gave Core cash of 12,000. We need to see that how much cost could be associated with this cash. This is of as what I told you with the help of calculation 6231. So cost is going to be deducted 6231. Now we come to know what the gain figure is. The gain figure is of 12,000 less 6231. This would be of 5769 pounds. So this is like said to be the capital gain or you can also call it as chargeable gain 
on which CGT liability in the tax year 23-24 shall be calculated. Is this point clear? If yes, then I'll move forward. As one has nothing to do with this disposal of statue. So let's move to the disposals which were made in the tax year 23-24 on August in August 23, Kori sold a house. See, it's a residential property. So one should be like alert that rates of CGT are going to be changed. But that was situated in Medora. This house was purchased on 1st July 2020 and has always been rented out. The sale realized a gain of 34,500. See, students, this is the house not located in UK not existing in UK. But in the tax year 23-24, Corey himself is a UK resident person. Just suggest me what should I do? Do I need to compute the gain or the loss? Do I need to do any calculation? Yes or no? Yes. As being a UK resident person, whatsoever the income you are going to receive, whatsoever the gain you are going to generate, whether it's related to local gains, local income i mean related to uk or if it is related to overseas that's taxable for uk tax purposes so cgt liability definitely is going to be calculated on it right now we need to see that what gain or loss would arise on this house and the point is that the situation is like under control because the gain it's like already calculated Though calculation of gain is very simple, against the disposal proceed, we can deduct the cost and that's how we come to know what the gain figure is. And this gain is not eligible for any uh, relief because this house has always been rented out. So nobody needs to, no one needs to think about uh, principal private residence relief or anything like this. So the gain is like already calculated. It's 34,500. It is also treated to be the gain related to the tax year uh, 23-24. So as I started doing the calculation related to the gains made in the tax year 23-24, um, in which I had to include the shares disposal related to SQ Public Limited Company, though the actual disposal did not take place in 23-24, but the gain has to be considered due in the tax year 23-24 because of the implication of temp temporary absence period ab abroad. So what the gain was uh, there uh, on the disposal of SQ public limited shares as a result of takeover, it's 5769 sparing in the cell C35 is equal to C35. So this is the gain. I mean, current year gain, but one should not consider it as the gain related to uh, residential property because residential property rates are different. So I'll keep them separate. So this is the normal gain, other gain, other than the residential property. And how much gain is going to be due over the disposal of uh, overseas house gain related to house in medora this has already been calculated this is relevant to residential property and uh, the best part the gain has been calculated by themselves is 34500 so i'm just going to keep this gain separately and then comes the third disposal on 1st December 2023 Corey gave his sister Florence 700 of the 4000 shares he owned in TW Public Limited Company one share in TW Public Limited Company was worth 4.5 pound on that day so technically, he gave his sister the shares. He did not sell it off, right? Okay, uh, sorry, I did not answer a few questions which appeared lately. Um, 
gain is more than 2000 pounds so it should be automatically treated under a rising basis absolutely right yes the recording is going to be uploaded uh i skipped one question as well uh, two questions right uh, i want to know if there is a group where the answers will be shared do you want to take the standard solution is that what you are asking about and there is another question is it for uk only tax so the gbp will be the main currency unless there will be other currencies involved yes uh, as we are going to opt for uk taxation which is why we'll have to use the sign of pound okay uh, the recordings will definitely be made available uh, the link will be given in the description of the video uh, which you can access later but if in case you have any problem uh, related to accessing the video or anything else let me just give you the number uh, of our support staff member and an email address as well uh, on which you can send your queries The telephone number is 9232-4922-1387. So that's the number uh, of our support team. Uh, you can contact them if in case you cannot be able to find anything else related to this video or anything which is like available in general for taxation purposes, for advanced taxation purposes specifically. And there is an email ID uh, as well, which I'm going to provide you on which you can send your queries. It is about support at wifi.com, right? But if you talk about any specific WhatsApp group in which the queries could be discussed, then unfortunately, this is not available for the students who are attending right now. Um, this session as a general session, because we give the facility of WhatsApp group to only those students who are a part of our uh, proper session. So, uh, to all those students who have joined the course properly, they are given with this facility of WhatsApp group in which the queries could, could be discussed and the answers can be shared. But if you um, just need to have uh, uh, the answers related to it, I can definitely uh, support you in this regard. I'll share those questions with you. But unfortunately, there is not a consistent sort of group for you people in which the queries can be discussed every now and then. Right. So moving back to the question. Now what I have to do, um, Corey gave his sister Florence 700 out of 4,000 shares. Remember, if you're a part of uh, crash course or any batch, which is a proper, which is like being run by Wifi on a proper basis, then you will definitely be given with the WhatsApp group facility. Otherwise, that's not the case. Yes, that's the separate group in which all the recorded lectures and notes, everything is made available. Okay, we are running short of time as well. So, uh, Corey gave his sister Florence 700 of the 4,000 shares he owned in TW Public Limited Company. Remember that when SQ Public Limited Company was taken over by TW Public Limited Company, there we got cash as well as shares. And out of these 4,000 shares, he gave 700 shares to his sister. When so there's said to be a change in the ownership of asset, which is the case over here, we need to compute the gain. As he has just given away these shares to his sister, could be called as gift so when something is being given to a connected person below market value then market value shall be treated as disposal proceed so here 700 shares are being transferred from core to florence which is why chargeable gain will be calculated it's going to be due on the donor 
on Kore. And for the sake of disposal uh, proceeds purposes, I'll be taking into account the market value because um, whensoever two connected persons are going to uh, exchange an asset, if they are going to have an asset, transfer an asset, then market value at the date of transfer shall be treated as disposal proceed. So here comes the third transfer. Gift of 700 shares, right? Once again, I need to know what the disposal figure is. And then I am going to deduct the cost. And that's how we'll be able to come to know what the gain is. As in the question, it is said that 4.5 pound is the market value of the of each share which was gifted and 700 shares were given away. So it's like how we are going to get the disposal figure. It's like is equal to 4.5 into 700 that makes the disposal proceed now students i need to know that where the cost of these 700 shares is given does anyone have any idea absolutely right the workings which we did as a result of takeover we had already apportioned the cost we had split the past cost over shares as well as cash. For cash, we have computed the gain. And surprisingly, out of these 4,000 shares, we have given away 700 shares. And this cost is going to be used for this purpose. 7,269. This was the cost for 4,000 shares. Right? And how many shares were transferred? 700 shares. So technically, I need to know the cost for 700 shares only. Keep this value in mind, 7269. Otherwise, you can use cell a reference number for the sake of computation purposes, which actually gives a more professional look when examiner would be uh, like uh, digging out the answers and seeing that what has actually been solved from your side. So 7269.23. I'm going to round it off as 7269 minus as this is the cost, it should be deducted. So whichsoever thing is to be deducted should be presented with the sign of minus 7269 is the cost. It's related to 4,000 shares out of which only the cost related to 700 shares is relevant right now because not all the shares are transferred. So the cost is of 1272.5. Zero 08 and that's how the gain will be of is equal to sum i'm selecting the cells it's of 1877.93 so what the gain figure is 1877.93 or simply you can take it as 1878 so this is the gain on which normal cgt rates will be applied it is the gain related to uh, residential properties on which different rates are applicable or if the gain is qualifying for business as a disposal reef, that's only the case where the, the rate becomes static. The only flat rate of 10% will be applied. Otherwise, the normal rate is 10% in basic band and 20% in high rate band. So this is like gain related to 700 shares which were being gifted to his sister Florence. Now see, I have taken up all the gains in my calculation and I have kept the gain related to house and Medora separately because the rates are different. Now I am going to See that this is the current year gain against which the current year losses are to be deducted. But could you see there is no current year loss at all, right? 
no other asset has been disposed of in the tax year 23 24 which would uh, be disposed of over loss then we are going to deduct annual exemption annual exempt amount is of 12300 pounds can you please tell me that i have two separate types of gains and they both are of current year gains what should i choose shall i choose other gains for deducting annual exempt amount of 12000 or i do i need to give preference to residential property for the sake of deducting 12300 because either way it can be deducted it can be deducted from other gains it can be deducted from residential property but if i have to choose wisely then what should i do yes where the tax is higher as residential property has got high rates as compared to normal gains, which is why we would choose residential property for the sake of deducting annual exempt amount of 12,300 pounds. Now, as there is no brought forward loss as well, so I'm going to conclude in order to see what the taxable gain under each category is. When it comes to other gains, the other gains are of 7,649 or 7,647 pounds. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Um, 7647 and the taxable gain related to the residential property that's of 22,200 pounds. So this is like said to be the taxable gain. And now on this taxable gain, one has to compute capital gains tax when one has to compute the capital gains tax it should be clear that if there is like any availability as far as basic rate band is concerned and this information was also given over there it was told in the requirement that for the tax year 23-24 Kore is receiving a taxable income. By taxable income, income which belongs to non-saving, saving and dividend. It is the overall total income against which deduction of interest paid on qualifying loan as well as deduction of personal allowance has been made in order to see what the taxable income is. So the taxable income for the tax year 23-24 is of... Sorry... 42,000... 320 pounds but no that's before the deduction of personal allowance so this is the income less interest paid on qualifying loans we still need to deduct personal allowance as well and once personal allowance is deducted then we eventually come to know what the real taxable income is according to which tax rates are decided so 42320 42320 available basic rate band as we have in general basic rate band of 37,700 out of which we need to see what the taxable income is. The taxable income is 42320 less 12,570. I mean you can also do the calculation separately. I mean instead of showing it in the same cell you can like do the calculation step by step as in the taxable income is what it is 42320 less 12,570 that's of 29750 and that's how the available basic rate band will be determined by taking into account 37,700, which is the maximum figure in the band against which 29,750 has been consumed in order to see that how much of the basic rate band is still left. Is equal to 37. 700 less 29750 it's of 7950 now 
it is up to you whether you would use other games for the sake of uh, utilizing the basic rate band or you'll be using the residential property for the sake of applying basic rate band either way you're going to get the same answer so do not okay single cell is like better yes it's more professional as long as you can handle the cell so it's better instead of like uh, doing incorrect calculations it's better to spend uh, some time on doing uh, lengthy calculations but to end up with the right calculations okay so what i was telling you that though the basic rate band is left it is totally up to you whether you would start applying taxes from uh, on other gains and then you'll be moving to residential property or you will start using the band over residential property and then moving back to other gains either way you're going to get the same answer i'm just going to take a start with residential property though either way the answer will be same so 7950 this is the available figure of basic rate band on 7950 as I'm going to apply on the residential property, residential property basic rate is 18%. So 7950 into 18%, that would lead to 1431. And then the remaining gain out of 22,200, as 7950 has been taxed under the basic rate band, the remaining gain is going to be taxed over a high rate of 28%. So it's like is equal to brackets open 22,200 less 7950. The remaining amount is going to be taxed over a high rate where the high rate for residential property is 28%. That makes 3,990 pounds. And now we are going to tax our other gains. Our other gains figure is of 7647 on which, of course, the high rate is going to be applied, which is 20%. So this would lead to 7647 into 20%. So that would lead to 1529.4. And students, it is not compulsory that you will first be showing that how did you calculate your answer? Then you'll be doing all the things in the cell as well. As long as you'll be like doing the calculation in the cell, your examiner will click on the cell, he will come to know that how did you perform the calculation, the, the whole calculation or the working will becomes apparent in front of him, then it is of no need to repeat the working, right? So let's see what overall capital gains tax figure is. So the overall tax figure is of 6950.4. This is like said to be our CGT liability, right? Okay, quickly move towards the proposed gifts. Made by Emma. Um, it is said that Kore has asked for advice on the inheritance tax uh, advantages of his mother, Emma, who is UK domiciled, making lifetime gifts to Kore of either or both of the uh, Falling paintings, there's a water cooler of 41,000 pounds and there is a chance that it would fall in value. And there's a portrait as well whose value is 37,000 pounds, but it would increase in its value. So this limited information is given in the question. Could you see, let me just jot down a few points that if Kore's mother is alive, she is domiciled, whatsoever she's going to give away to her son in the lifetime, that would, would be counted as PET, PET, potentially exempt transfer, on which one shall only be uh, calculating um, the chargeable amount of gift, but no tax liability is going to be due. But if Emma dies within seven years of making the transfer, then death IHT shall be due on the assets gifted in her lifetime. And if I have to ad give an advice that whether she needs to make a transfer right now or at the death, then keep one thing in mind that there is an asset for which there is an expectation that it would fall in value. So for instance, if she keeps the asset till her death, the value of the asset would have been reduced. And if she dies and this asset would become a part of her 
death estate, a lower value comparatively will become a part of a death estate on which lower tax will be imposed. Though there could also be a chance that if she's like going to give away the gift right now, this would eventually be like having a decrease in the value and it's not something on which there was an expectation. I mean, this was not a depreciating asset. So if it is like um, not expected on the asset that loss could appear uh, eventually, then fall in value relief can be obtained as a result of calculating death IHT on lifetime transfer in which uh, the gross chargeable amount will be reduced and hence death IHT will be reduced as well. But when it comes to portrait, I would suggest that transfer has to be made right now because currently the market value is low and it is anticipated that it would gain its value in future. And if it is likely to gain value in future, then currently the value is low. If gift is made right now in her lifetime, the value will be locked because the transfer of value will actually be capturing the value which is prevailing right now. So considering uh, if we uh, come up with the value which is lower, it would result into a lower value of taxes. Though no tax liability is going to be due right now in the current tax year in which gift is made. But if she dies within seven years, even then the lower value shall be liable for tax purposes. So see, let's focus on the verb which is mentioned in part C. Again, we have to make an explanation. So response should be given on word. And this part of the question is of six marks. Here they say, explain with respect to the amount of inheritance tax payable only, whether it would be beneficial for Emma to make lifetime gift of either or both of her paintings as opposed to retaining them till her death. There's no need to address the annual exemption as Emma makes use of this every year. So she's like making other transfers as well. She's like already has ample transfers to consume the an annual exempt amount. So no need to pay attention to this thing. You just need to consider tax right away on the chargeable amount of gift. And you should assume there's no nil red band available regardless of when the transfer would take place. So uh, without uh, worrying about any annual exempt amount or nil rate band we straight away have to compute the tax liability but in the absence of this note which i'm going to highlight right now in the absence of these two notes if these two notes were not provided i shall have definitely taken into account of both annual exemption as well as nil rate band there's a question, NRB is available only on death? No, no. It is like available in the lifetime transfer as well as on death. But here, when the transfers made in the lifetime are uh, pets, are potentially exempt transfers, when the transfers are made to individuals, then that's not subject to any NRB. But if in the lifetime, the transfers were made to trust, this would be regarded as CLT, chargeable lifetime transfer, on which NRB would definitely be available even the asset is being transferred in the lifetime, right? Now I'm going to choose again the word processing form. And this is the requirement C for which I'm going to give, make a response. So what are the advantages of lifetime gift as this is what we have to discuss before doing any calculation. As the gifts are likely uh, to be given to the individual, so they are potentially exempt transfer, no inheritance tax is going to be charged if the donor would survive for seven years. So when I have to focus on advantages, the gifts made in the lifetime of Emma will be regarded as pet. So 
no tax will arise in the lifetime and there will be no IHT due on death as well if Emma survives for seven years after making the gift, right? So this is the first advantage. Now, what second point I could mention? Even if she dies within seven years, death IHD or lifetime transfer is going to be calculated, but you know, there will be an implication of taper relief, which would eventually reduce the tax liability in the end. Uh, provided she would at least survive for three years. So if she's like going to die at least after three years of making the gift, there shall be an implication of uh, taper relief uh, on death IHD. So if Emma dies within seven years, though death IHD will be due on the transfer but the tax could likely be reduced because of the application of taper relief provided at least three years have elapsed since she had made the transfer, right? Then any other advantage which you would like to share and uh, considering the, uh, the other advantage which I'm asking you to uh, tell me, that's something which you have already told me in the dialogue box. Yeah, fallen value relief as well as the value which is to be taken into account when we are calculating uh, lifetime calculations as lifetime transfer would involve the values of asset prevailing at the time of life, which normally the case is, will lead to lower value of taxes. And now I'm going to connect it, but in the case of, I guess that was water cooler. Um, yes. But in case of water cooler, as the value is expected to fall in future 
there will be an implication of fall in value relief provided um Kore will still be owning the painting at the time uh, of his death or uh, if it is like sold, then it must have been sold at an arm's length transaction. So the fall in Value relief will be available, but that's going to affect uh, the IHT, which is going to be due on watercolor itself. When calculating the IHT on subsequent gifts and on the death estate, the value of the watercolor at the time of the gift, that is the higher amount, would be used. Do you remember that um, the gross chargeable amount of the gift is determined at the point when the gift is actually made? So when the transfers are subsequently made and they shall be... Uh, they will be entitled to have NRB. The NRB is adjusted uh, with the help of uh, GCA, with the help of gross chargeable amount of the transfers made in the last seven years. And it is the original GCA which is going to reduce uh, the NRB. It is not the subsidized one, the reduced one with the help of fall in value relief, which could hit our NRB. The original N GCA without considering fall in value relief will be used for the sake of reducing our NRB in the future. So you can also write down this point while answering your part of this question. So let me just write it down because that's not going to make much of the difference. Um, but it's original GCA, which will reduce future NRB, right? So this is like the answer related to part C. If there's anything else which you need to know, Kindly tell me so that the confusion can be removed. As they did not ask us to do the uh, calculation and they did not even ask us to take anything else into account related to annual exemption discussion or uh, NRP. We had to just explain the impact. See, just read the requirement of the question again. We had to explain with the with respect to the amount of IHT payable only, whether it would be beneficial for Emma to make a lifetime gift of either both of her paintings as opposed to retaining them until her death. I mean, the watercolor or the simple painting, whether she should retain it or uh, gift it now. We had made a comprehensive comparison of like uh, uh, by like uh, telling the advantages associated with the lifetime transfer but we did not discuss any advantage or disadvantage which could be associated with annual exemption or the implication of NRB that's what they actually prohibited us to do uh, we, we need not to talk about the portrait it's uh, like explicitly because when we said that all the assets which whose value is like going to be determined right now, this is the third point, as lifetime transfer is like going to uh, be involving the value which is prevailing right now, that's basically the value which should be used for the sake of determining the transfer of value for IHT purposes when lifetime transfers are going to take place. And uh, in that case, it is going to cover the portrait. So if you want to emphasize on portrait you can simply say that as in case of 
portrait which is likely to increase in its value, right? So this is how you can even link it with the situation if in case you find it necessary. And that's perfectly fine. I would emphasize on these things as well that as long as you will keep on linking the implications with the real scenarios, that's like going to give a much better impression. Now, students, we have to have a look at part, the fourth exhibit for which part D is the requirement. See, in this exhibit, technically, it's of 12 marks. So that's going to be a huge requirement, which I think the time is running short. Um, what I believe that I should do requirement E with you right now today. And I will definitely go through this requirement D tomorrow. Considering the not much time is left, so uh, it's it doesn't look appropriate if I leave the question in the middle because that's 12 marks question in which research and development expenditure and detailed discussion is required. So uh, half an hour uh, will be required if both of these requirements are to be done. So I think I should pay attention to this requirement D. This requirement D will definitely be discussed, but in tomorrow's session, what do you say? Okay, so let's have a look at requirement E. I have become aware that a few months ago, CORE received a refund of income tax from HMRC in respect of the tax year 1920. See, 1920 long ago. Um, this, this amount has been paid in the tax year 1920, which must be an overpaid value of taxes for which he's like going to give, get refund right now. He's not been able to determine why the refund was made, but he's like not sure of the fact that why this refund was made in respect of the income tax refund set out the actions which our firm should take and the matters which should be brought to Corey's attention. So one should be well aware of the fact that why he's like going to get any refund and especially from HMRC, the tax authority. But if he's like not sure of the fact that we need to figure out the few points which Corey needs to know regarding this refund thing. Okay, I'm just going to tell you that In the fifth exhibit, as we have uh, skipped this fourth exhibit, which we are going to do tomorrow. In the fifth exhibit, all the requirements were mentioned in detail. I mean, no further information related to this refund matter is given. So it is just this short paragraph for which I need to formulate my answer so with the help of these five lines i need to see what ethical matter what professional issue i could bring into the notice of core which he needs to take action about um and see uh the ethical concerns are always tested it's it's like without any doubt ethical matters are always tested it's a very small chapter um, a very little content is associated with ethical ethics and five marks part is for sure tested. It is like always revolving around ethical dilemmas, ethical issues of uh, taxation. So one should have a good know-how of that uh, a little bit content because that little content is going to give you enough credit. So what do I need to consider? First of all, here we have to again explain so I'm going to choose word processing sheet. And as what I've told you that we can change the sequence. So here I am going to do requirement E. But why did I change this equation? Just because I was like running short of time. Otherwise, I would have surely gone with requirement D. But the, que the question is, if you're good at ethics and be professional, we'll score 25 marks easily. Yes, 
that's true. So the matter is about refund of income tax for the tax year 1920. Uh, as I hope you remember that this is the memorandum being made by the tax senior, which is addressing uh, the manager. So we shall be using the term you in order to address the person to whom this matter is being communicated. Number one, We should review Corey's tax return for this year in order to determine whether there is a valid reason for a refund or not. So we should review the return of 1920 for Mr. Corey to figure out, to determine whether the refund is valid or not. And then second thing, you can also make bullet points instead of like writing down one, two. You can also present your answer like this. Um, Okay, so these are the several presentation methods one can use uh, for the sake of constructing response. So if we conclude that the refund is made as an error, which is obviously error, obviously the error made by HMRC, we would be telling Corey to repay the amount immediately because if tax authority would come to know later that they had made a cash outflow to someone else and someone else is like silent about the fact, they'll take uh, it as a criminal offense. So that's like maybe yes, there is a bullet hub as well. You can use it. Even you can make uh, columns, rows with the help of uh, uh, this exam portal. See this one and two thing, this short points. Sorry. Okay, so if we conclude that HMRC has made this refund by mistake, then we would urge Kore to make the refund immediately as otherwise it will be treated as criminal offense by the tax authority, right? Then on the other hand, HMRC has to be informed that this error has been made by them on as soon as possible basis. And um, this would lead to what this could uh, lead to uh, the minimization of any interest and penalties, which may otherwise become payable. And we need to inform HMRC if our letter of engagement authorizes us to do so. Alternatively, we could advise Kore to do so. So HMRC 
on the other hand has to be informed about this issue as soon as possible if we i mean uh, the team who is working as tax advisors on the behalf of core if we have an authority to inform hmrc directly then we will send them the relevant details in the form of letter or email otherwise if core has not allowed us to interact to hmrc on his behalf then we would ask core to do so right okay what else we can write under this for instance for instance we can, because we have to make up the story that this refund was like made for no reason and uh, one has to refund one has to inform hmrc for instance if core is like not willing to pay back this amount then what we have to do of course if he is like not willing then uh, resigning is the last option we would stop providing services to him and we will bring this matter into the notice of money laundering uh, money laundry uh, laundering regulations but we need not to inform hmrc that what is the reason behind leaving the services but that we have left providing services for this client has to be brought into the attention of uh, hmrc so hmrc should know that we have stopped working for them the reason needs not to be disclosed in front of hmrc though this matter could be like uh, discussed somewhere else but not in front of hmrc so if pore is found unwilling to repay this amount then we should cease acting as their as his tax advisor and along with that we need to notify hmrc that our firm is no longer working for core and last of all we can also consider if it is felt necessary to make a report about this matter to money i guess that's enough of what can be discussed regarding this ethical dilemma probably there could be a chance that core will be happily uh, uh, able to refund this amount to hmrc and we will not have to make up such stories but considering it is the email internal 
uh, memorandum being made where the tax senior is like addressing the matter that what course of action we'll have to take if in case the result goes positive and if in case uh, they find that the other person is not willing to refund the amount, to repay the amount back to HMRC. So if there is anything else you need to know related to any uh, requirement which we have done in today's session, please let me know if there is like left any query, any issue which is not yet resolved. Right. So thank you so much for being a part of this session. In tomorrow's session, we'll be discussing the leftover part of this question as well as the two questions uh, which are typically tested under section B, right? Thank you so much. Goodbye.